Hopefully you won't get, uh, is this thing on? Okay, there it is. All right. No, you won't have to. I don't usually preach that long, no way. If I'd say that at our assembly, somebody in the back would say, yeah, right. You guys want me to turn it on for him? I, di- I didn't turn it on, see, because we don't have where to go for a supper. Yeah. But if, so if it goes off, I don't have to pay any attention, right? Okay. Now, I'm going to give you a commercial no, no, you anyway. feel just like everybody else. Push the start when the when the commercial comes on, is over. Okay. And then, then you have something legitimate to ignore. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, well... I would like to thank Brother Richard and Grace School of the Bible for the privilege to be here to preach at this conference. Uh, it's not something I take lightly. I, I appreciate the opportunity every time I get to preach God's Word. That's why we go uh, to the retirement home on Sundays. And I tell you, if you if you want to preach, don't be like some of the men that I grew up around. Want to sit on the front pew so they could be in the. They used to call it the Amen Corner. If you want to preach, there's plenty of nursing homes, retirement homes, places where you can minister. I mean, it's not a church. It's not a pulpit like you want, like most young people want. But uh, I tell you, there's plenty of preaching that can be done. I started my ministry in the nursing home. So uh, remember that. If you have a desire to stand and preach God's word uh, or minister to people, there's places to minister. And we used to be on the street every other Saturday. But I've come to the point, I'm just so busy, I don't really have time to go out and do that like we used to. Uh, But we used to, every other Saturday, we went to the street corner downtown Concord and stood and uh, my brother would sing, would pass out tracts, I'd preach and uh, give away DVDs and CDs. We'd done all that stuff standing there and uh, I miss that and we're going to get back to doing it when we get, we've got to make some time for it. Uh, The reason I said all that is for this. Grace School of the Bible, if you want a missionary or a mission to support, you want a place to put some money, support Grace School of the Bible. It is a very good uh, a mission and outreach. I thank God for it because had it not been for the television ministry, I may have never seen Richard, may have never heard him, and uh, may not be where I am today. And I appreciate that. So that is a good mission if you'd like to support it. All right? I guess I'll hit this button now. Because I'm going to read you a funny, and I reckon I ought to go ahead and include that in my time. I don't. I was told one time not to waste time reading funnies. They, they told me, they, they said that before I ever got in the room. I never heard it with my own ears. And it was up there in the mountains, you know, the, what they call the Smoky Mountain. And it was said, and I, it was said before I ever walked in, you know, and it was said, don't be telling jokes. It ain't a place to tell jokes. And I stepped up there when it was my turn. I just told some jokes. <laughs> so, but uh, I'll start this anyway because I want to, you know, I always read a funny. And I got to give you a good one. To me, it's good. A man in dining, a man is dining in a fancy restaurant, and there is a gorgeous redhead sitting at the next table. He has been checking her out since she sat down, but lacks the nerve to talk to her. Suddenly, she sneezes, and her glass eye comes flying out of its socket towards the man. He reflect he re- reflexively reaches out grabs it out of the air, and hands it back. Oh, I am so sorry, the woman says, as she pops her eye back in place. Let me buy your dinner to make it up to you, she says. They enjoy a wonderful dinner together, and afterwards, they talk, they laugh, they share, uh, she shares her deep dreams, and he shares his. She listens. After paying for everything, She asked him if he would like to come to her place for breakfast in the morning. He arrives at her house the next morning. She cooks a gourmet meal with all the trimmings. The man is amazed. Everything has been so incredible. You know, he said, you are the perfect woman. Are are you this nice to every man you meet? No, she replies. 
You just happened to catch my eye. Uh, all right, you probably won't remember anything I said, but you'll remember that, won't you? <laughs> anyway, uh, turn to the book of Isaiah 44, verse 6 through 8 is the text for, this, for tonight or today. Is God a Christian? Have you ever asked that question? You ever heard how you, you hear a lot of people talk about how this is a Christian nation, and um, when you go to study in some of the things about this nation... You find out what's made this country great is the fact that this book has been honored by a lot of people in this country. We walk the streets of, I've done a funeral uh, service in Washington, D.C. there at the the war, the the army uh, graveyard there. And we went ahead and walked through the city. I'd never been there. And we walked through the city. And I couldn't believe the verses of Scripture that I found graved in stone all over the place. The Bible's all over Washington. Well, it used to be. It's been a long time since I've been there. Uh, But uh, there used to be verses of your King James Bible uh, carved all over the place there. But the, the Word of God is very important. And if you want to answer the question, is God a Christian? You need to go to the Bible. And... I hope that you understand. When you ask the question, is God a Christian? Would you have to ask the question, is he a Hindu? Is God a Muslim? Well, you know, you'd have to come to the conclusion that no, he's not. We passed several cars on our way up here or several cars passed us. And I noticed the, uh, I said it backwards. I meant to say it the right way the first time. But I did pass several coming up here. But we were coming and we, there were some went by. And I seen two cars go by that had Buddha statues stuck on the dash. You ever seen that? They're out there. And I mean, uh, I've seen two of them and they had the Buddha statue. It was stuck right there on the dash, right up in the middle. And the statue was there. And so you understand there's a lot of people who worship and serve other gods little g um i pulled up on the website different religions i pulled up hinduism and looked at it you know how many deities you can find and i, and I left a lot of those papers at home i was going to bring them but uh i did, i left them at home but i we can look them up on the website if you've never done that I, the deities are, are unreal that they they call deities one of them uh or a lot of them have different arms and uh, six arms. I mean, you know, you see those things and uh, the gods they serve. You ever read in the book of Revelations about the creatures around the throne of God? You ever read about one having six wings? Oh, I wonder where that might, thought might have come from. Well, you, you think about stuff like that and you see stuff. And, and there, there was one of the deities that the, was a woman sitting there and uh, it looked like an a elephant trunk coming off of her face. And I, look, and I don't know the names of that. I didn't look at all the names and didn't look all that stuff up. But I was amazed at some of the things people worship, some of the things people do. Uh, I went over and checked out the tomb of Mohammed. You ever done that? You ever looked at the tomb of Mohammed? It's there. Very, very, I mean, it's a beautiful place to the human eye to look at the way it's, it's kept up and all that stuff. But when you also you go and you look at where Jesus was buried. There's two different tombs there that they say that Jesus could have been buried in. One of two. But do you know that both of them were empty? They wasn't really garnished the way man would garnish some kind of an idol or something. It was just an empty tomb. Empty. And I'm glad it was uh, empty when I I seen it. I've never been there. I heard people talking how people go there and see those things. But people make religion beautiful. The only religion that has a resurrection connected to it, however, is associated with Jesus Christ, Son of God. You do know that Hinduism, they have that reincarnation, and a lot of them will starve beside of a cow. I tell you what, I love a good porterhouse steak myself. 
But, you know, some people think that's Grandma or Aunt Sally. You know, some of the thoughts about religion, you think about, you know, it's very important to get into the Word of God and find out about the gods you serve. You have Isaiah 44. We're going to come back there. Go to Acts chapter number 11. Acts chapter number 11. Asking the question, is God a Christian? Acts chapter number 11, verse number 26. Now get verse 25. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Wow. If they were called Christians first at Antioch, how can God be a Christian when the word never occurs until, what, 35, 40 A.D. maybe? Over here with Paul. I mean, you you got to go all the way back here to where God's working in the earth. And if God were a Christian, wouldn't it start way back here? So you know God's not a Christian. Why? God's God. He's Jehovah God. He's the only God. Uh, and some of the stuff you find out there on the Internet, when you're looking at stuff, you have to be kind of careful with some of that stuff. Let the Bible be true and every man a liar. You know, Islam is... Uh, said what I read about and seen to have been founded by Muhammad somewhere around 600 A.D. So, I mean, that would put you up in here after the body of Christ had already been started with Paul, the Apostle Paul. So when you, when you, you see those things and you think about it, you know that God can't be a Christian. I mean, he can't be called Christian. And, and he, he can't be... Uh, called a, a Muslim or a Hindu because God is God. Some gods have names and they are associated with other gods. But the scriptures are clear when it goes to talking about God. And when you look at God and you see how he's referenced and referred to, go back to Isaiah 44. And this passage of scripture over here talks about God. And I was talking to Brother David earlier today. You could do a whole series on this one verse. This one verse would produce a series. And I'm not saying somebody hadn't already done a series on it because uh, there's so much here. And I'm sure somebody probably somewhere along the line has done a series from this passage. Isaiah 44, verse 6. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last. And beside me there is no God. And who, as I, shall call and shall declare it and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come, let them show unto them. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. Let's have just a word of prayer. Father, as we go further on into this today, I pray right now you'll help us as we study your word together. And I pray that your word, Lord, will be clear and understandable. May we see it, take it, and may it be very, very real in our heart and life as we study it. In the name that's above every name. Your Son, Jesus Christ, and our Savior, we ask these things. Amen. When you look at that passage and you think about what's there, you see, Brother Allen talked this morning about the triune Godhead. God is God, and He'll always be God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And when you look at this passage, and uh, the men that spoke this morning, I enjoyed the messages this morning. They all built upon uh, who God is. Talked about Jesus Christ being the Savior. And, and as the Jehovah's Witness don't believe in the, the Trinity. I I've got one of their, I tried for a long time to get one of their uh, 
Bible, what they call a Bible, uh, New World Translations, and now I've got two hardbacks and a leatherback. People just kept bringing them to me. But do you know I can take their New World Translation and prove to them the Trinity? I can prove to them in their own uh, Bible that they, they call the Bible, uh, what the, their translation, it proves that Jesus Christ stood and talked to Jesus Christ. Seen God. And yet no man's seen God, but they have seen Jesus Christ, who is the image of the Godhead. And you look at this verse. Now, I was going to put this up, but I'm not going to be able to. But maybe it'll help you understand what I'm getting ready to show you in this passage. That, I didn't bring any tape, by the way. That is what's in this verse. You see that? Look at the verse. Thus saith the Lord. Number two, the king of Israel. Number three, his redeemer. Number four, the Lord of hosts. Number five, I am. Number six, I am the first and the last. And look at that next part. And beside me, you notice there is no S. Do you realize there's not another God that people serve and Paul says we know there's God's many but only one God and Father there is no God that can equal or stand beside or come alongside of God Almighty Jehovah God none could be beside him that verse says and beside me there is no God not only does it say it one time he says that two times Go back up to to verse 8. The last part of the verse. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. And I I can report to you today that the series could be brought, brought right there. The Lord. I mean, you could do a lot of preaching right there in that verse. But I want you to notice here that uh, he says at least nine times in your Bible, he references, I am the first and the last. Do you know that it was God that created heaven and earth in the beginning? Do you know that it's going to be God that's going to bring it all back to fruition when it comes down to the dispensation of the fullness of times? Uh, and even uh, after the great white throne judgment, these things are going to take place. He's the first, he's the last. God is God. This is a a great passage of Scripture. It talks about uh, He's the Lord, He's Jehovah. And and you can go through and you can look at the name after name after name after name that He's called by Jehovah. Uh, All those names. And, And it's what He's doing for the nation of Israel. He's the King of Israel. He's the Redeemer of Israel. Do you know Israel... Israel never has been able to save herself. That she's, uh, every time she come to that, God always took care of it when Israel as a nation depended upon him. When they got in their own way, what happened to them? It always fall by the wayside. God always took care of them. It had to be God. No other God can do the things the Lord God has done. When you look there at the next verse, verse number 7, those first two words, and who? Turn with me to the book of Job, chapter number 38. Job, chapter number 38. I don't know if you've ever read through this passage and and just studied this passage and looked at it. This is about the creation. You understand there's no God that any man worships today, any man, woman, boy, or girl. There's no God on the face of this earth that is able to create anything. Satan himself can't create. The only thing he can do is usurp what God already has created. And he does uh, a lot of deceiving and deception in the things that he does. 
But verse number, uh, Job number 38, verse number 1, The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? That's a good question, isn't it? A lot of people trying to put some knowledge in somewhere, and, and the counsel in, they don't have a bit of knowledge to do it with. Number three, gird up now thy loins like a man, for I, that, that word I, it appears in this passage four times. For I will demand of thee and answer thou me. Where was thou when I laid the foundation of the earth? Declare if thou hadst understanding. Who hath laid the measure thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Notice that word who just just keeps uh, popping up at least 12 times in this passage. And Isaiah 44 verse 7 says, And who as I shall call and shall declare it? And who? When you think about that and then you look at this, how what he's saying over here when he creates the earth, when he creates uh, the, the angelic host, when, he, when he's creating. Uh, verse 4 he says, Where was thou when I laid the foundation of the earth? Nobody stop me. That's got an S on it. You notice that? Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hadst understanding. Who hath laid the measure thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? Who in the world could hang the earth on nothing? And it just be there. Only God. Not some little G God, but Jehovah God. The triune Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Verse 7. Uh, let's read verse 6 and 7 together. Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, or who laid the cornerstone thereof, when the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God Shouted for joy. What about the uh, morning stars sang together? And the sons of God shouted for joy. When were the angels created? How were the angels created? Hold your finger here and look in the book of Psalm 33. Psalm 33. Psalm 33, verse number 6. Your page is turning, I'll wait. That's what I do at our place. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I just preach I'm in a hurry. Uh, Psalm 33, verse number 6. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. You want to get the context of his mouth? Go back to verse 5 or verse 4. For the word of the Lord is right. And all his works are done in truth. He loveth righteousness and judgment. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Jesus Christ brought about the angels. He brought about the host of the heavens. When you go back to the book of Job, as, as he goes on, into the book of Job, you understand something transpires here for you have, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Chapter 2, verse 1 says, the heavens were finished and all the hosts of them. Um, you, you come down through there and, and you read that thing and you look right on down through there. Verse number 8. Or who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth as if it had issued out of the womb? When I made the cloud the garment thereof, and thick darkness a swaddling band for it. People talking about the ocean's going to just take over the world again. Uh, you need to read the Word of God. You need to believe what God has to say about it. Then you'd be doing some good. Verse 10, And break up for it my decreed place, and set bars and doors. And said, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further. And here shall thy proud waves be stayed. Well, you read right down through there and you see 
Uh, there's some more who's on over there in the passage, verse number 23. He says, which I have reserved against the time of trouble, against the day of the battle and war. Well, what's he talking about? He's talking about Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. He's talking about the time period over here when the wrath comes and the trouble comes. Verse number 25, he says, Who hath who hath divided a water course for the overflowing of waters, or a way for the lightning of thunder. You look down to verse number 29. Out of whose womb came the ice and the hoary frost of heaven? Who hath gendered it? When you think about what he's talking, then he gets down there and he, he gets into some uh, about the heavenly things down there on, on into the passage. You get to talk, who could do that? What can God on earth can do that? Only Jehovah God. Jehovah God is the one who does that. He's the only one that can do it. You see, it was Lucifer who wanted to be like the Most High. He wanted to be the possessor of heaven and earth. He became the adversary of God. Look at Colossians chapter number 2. Colossians chapter number 2. This passage has already been read today. This verse has already been read today. Uh, Colossians chapter number I said chapter 2, I meant chapter 1. Colossians chapter number 1, verse 20. Some of you probably can quote it. Verse number 16 talks about, For by Him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible. God's the one that created. God Almighty, Jehovah God, created. For by Him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. You know, a lot of times these verses are left out, but read verse 17. And he is before all things. He is the I am, folks. And by him all things exist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in Him should all fullness dwell. Folks, that's your purpose of being a member of the body of Christ. You're going you're gonna to be bringing honor, glory, and praise to God eternally. And as it was stated today, that those things are going to happen there. Those things you and I are to uh, do as Paul said. Press toward the mark for the prize. That was stated this morning as well. That's going to be our conference theme, by the way, in November. Pressing toward the mark and that's what you're, you're to do that's what I'm to do on a daily basis is to press toward that mark how are you going to press toward the mark by looking at all the religions in the world by following all the gods in the world or by studying God's word you're going to have to get into the word of God you're going to have to learn something about this book you're going to have to grow you're going to have to learn and, and be fed by this book to, to walk more like Christ and to live that life and press toward that mark. But it's really not you doing it. It's when you take in that word and you allow God to work in you. It's Christ in you. though. It's God working through you. It's not you getting on that treadmill. Well, there's a lot of people doing that, aren't they? One of the members of our assembly let me know while we were on our way up here. His dad was 87 years old, and he, he went to be with the Lord, or he went into eternity. I'll put it that way. He was, he was religious. He went to church, and, uh, you know, um, he talked to me. We talked a little bit, and the heart's desire of him and his wife was to try to get his dad to see it's not what you do. It's what Christ done. So many people think they have to perform. They have to get on that treadmill. They have to do. Folks, it ain't nothing you can do but trust what Christ done. Do you realize that it's Christ who died for your sins on the cross, who was buried and who rose again the third day? It's Christ that's your only hope. And as Israel had to look to God in faith by his word, they always taught me growing up in the Baptist church that all these Old Testament saints looked to the cross. They were looking to the cross. Look, They weren't. I found out Peter wasn't. Man, Peter was ready to, to go to battle to keep the Lord Jesus from going to the cross. 
But that's your only hope. It's Christ. It's your only hope. Today is the cross. You see, Lucifer wanted to be like the Most High. He wanted, he, he wanted to be like the Most High, and he, he tries to take all these things away. And as you read this passage, you understand that God took care of that with his son. Verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in him Jesus Christ should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say whether it be things in earth or things in heaven. What religion on earth teaches you anything about that today? None of them. The only place you'll find anything about God reconciling heaven and earth through the cross of Jesus Christ is in that King James Bible, in God's Word to you, English-speaking people. You won't find it in any other religion. It's all about works. It's all about doing. It's all about things. I got to do, I got to do, I got to do. Had some folks come to our assembly a while and wanted to know more about the Bible. Want to know more about the Bible. Want to know more about right division. And they came from the Catholic Church, by the way. Me and my wife spent time with them. We spent all day one Saturday with them. We sat in a restaurant with them and eat. And, and I, I know the waitress got a little upset because we were sitting there so long. But we give her a little extra tip. But we, we flip page after page after page showing her, showing her, showing her verse after verse, her and her husband. And then when we, you know, we finally had to leave. I mean, we'd been there like two and a half, three hours. I know the woman was wanting somebody else at the table to get some bigger tips, you know. And, and I said, we're, we're going to have to get out of here for, for this lady at the table. And I was about to ask him if he wanted to come by the house. And she said, I ain't through. She said, I, and, and his wife, boy, she was just persuading to know more. And uh, she, she wanted to go to, uh, y'all probably know this place, Dunkin' Donuts. So we went to Dunkin' Donuts. And we went in, put our Bibles on the table, and, I was too full to eat anything, but I did drink some coffee. And we talked more and more and more. And you know, they came to the assembly for about two months. Young. You know, it's so hard for people to get out of that routine. I got to do, I got to do, I got to do. Spoke to them a while back. She spoke to my wife one day and. And uh, my wife mentioned to him about, you know, coming back and studying, learning some more. <laughs> Not a word. Cut off. I don't understand people in the religion. Well, I do. Is, religion's a powerful thing. But you have to understand God's greater. And if you'll take time to study his word, if you'll take time, maybe you're in a religion. Maybe you're watching by internet. Maybe you're in some religion. I'll tell you what. Take time to study God's word. Get with some people. Write the great school of the Bible. They'll get you some information, get you some help. You need to get out of that religion because, folks, listen, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Ezekiel 28, God created Lucifer. It's Lucifer he turned as, who turned and wanted to be like the Most High God, Isaiah 14. Genesis 14, he wanted to be like the Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. Genesis 3, well, turn to Genesis chapter number 3 and 4 real quick. Genesis chapter number 3, and look at verse number 4 and 5. And think about, when you think about gods in the earth today, and you think about the gods all around, you think about all these people in all these different religions. And if you talk to people, you can come across people who worship all kind of stuff. Where'd the gods that people worship come from? You ever thought about that? Genesis chapter number 3. Verse number one, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, yea, hath God said? And, and the last uh, message this morning was about the right version. Corrupt versions. Satan's twisting the word of God here. Yea, hath God said? He's questioning the word of God. Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And when, when all that discussion comes down to it verse number four and the serpent said unto the woman ye shall not surely die but god said they would surely die in chapter number one in verse 17 or chapter two verse 17 i believe it is um it says uh for god doeth know that in the day ye eat thereof your then your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as gods knowing good and evil gods like angels maybe like six-wing creatures and having a woman sitting around with six arms 
people worshiping uh, false gods. Satan has his way of bringing those things out for people to look at and to worship. And when you get to Genesis 11, look at Genesis 11. Here, you understand, I think you know, and if you don't, we'll read through it quickly. Verse number 1. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. There was not a lot of different tongues and languages. Everybody spoke the same language. It's Noah's children. And it came to pass as they, they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them throughly. Um, and, and they had uh, brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. Going to get them a religion, put a big steeple on top. And let us make us a name. And they're in direct disobedience to God with this, with this verse. Let us, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Now get the picture here. You got a whole bunch of people in one place and they're very religious. And they're building them a, building them a religion and a tower and a top who's reaching unto heaven. And they, they got that religion going. And all of a sudden, God scatters them across the face of the earth. Verse number 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower with which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they began to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech in verse number 8 and 9. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face. You got a whole bunch of people getting their own religion going, disregarding what God has to say. Now they're scattered all over the world. And you got religions all over the world today, don't you? People following Satan and what he says and misleading them and misguiding them and rejecting the very God from the Bible. Tell you what, there is no God besides Jehovah God, folks. Can't get it anywhere else. You've got to trust Jesus Christ. Look at uh, Genesis 24. I mean, Joshua 24. Joshua 24. I think this, this passage was read today in Joshua 24, but I don't think this, act, this verse was read in Joshua 24. But I want to read this verse to you. Joshua 24. You remember the children of Israel? Moses leads them out across the Red Sea. He leads them out to the, to the, uh, head to the promised land. They're headed out there. Moses dies. Joshua begins to lead. It was talked about how Joshua began to write down the Word of God and, and make copies of the Word of God. What happens there is a Get over there and they head toward the promised land. Verse 14. Or, or they're there at the promised land. Joshua 24 verse 14. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him. All cap. Jehovah God. Jesus Christ is Jehovah in the Old Testament. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. You know, Abraham, when God called Abraham, he was a hungry Syrian serving. He was a, he was a worshiping other gods. And, and God saved him. And you, you have the nation of Israel formed. God birthed that nation once. He's going to, that nation will be born in a day over here. And God's going to bring all that stuff back around to pass. And he says in verse 15, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods, little g, which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should 
forsake the Lord and serve other gods. Well, folks, listen today. There's plenty of gods in the world today that people are serving. And I hope that you don't forsake the Lord. I hope you wouldn't want to forsake the Lord. I hope you want to stay with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, some people get talking to other people and how, how sometimes they pull them away from where they are. Um, some people have wandered about from religion to religion, from religion to religion. And I tell you, today, you need to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to serve the God of the Bible. Now, if you will, go back with me to where we started at Isaiah. Israel was put to the test. Israel fell oftentimes, didn't they? Didn't. The nation fell over and over. You know what's going to happen in the end? Israel's not going to be able to save herself. Israel's going to have to look for God again to save her. I mean, Israel, how many times have they brought disgrace to the name of the Lord? And I tell you, no God can help them. No God ever has helped them. But God, Jehovah. Look there at verse number 7 again. And who, as I shall call and shall declare it and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come, let them show unto them. Nobody can do it but God. Look at uh, Ezekiel 36. And hold your finger there in Isaiah. I want to point a word out to you, and then I want to read to you in Ezekiel 36. You got Isaiah 36? Listen to this passage again. I'm reading in Isaiah 44. And who, as I, the Lord says, shall call and shall declare it and set it in order for me. He said, who's going to do it for me? Look at Ezekiel 36, verse number 21. But I had pity for mine holy name. which the house of Israel hath profaned among the heathen, whether they went. Therefore shall uh, say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for mine holy name's sake. God's doing it for himself. Nobody else can do it for him. God's doing it. Which ye have profaned among the heathen, whether ye went, and I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them, and the heathen shall know. When are they going to know? When are they going to know? And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you an heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and ye shall keep my judgments and do them and ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and ye shall be my people and I will be your God. And you can read on down through there. That's what God's going to do. Go back over to Isaiah 44. God's going to do it for His holy name. He's going to take Israel. He's going to do for them what she can't do for herself. And folks, you and I today, the only thing we can do is study this book, pray, and seek the Lord, and allow Him to live His life through us through His Word. When we allow His Word to work in our life, well, we, we can understand and know who He is, we won't have to worry about the gods of this world. We won't have to worry about all the things going on in the world today. 
you can understand who God is. Uh, I get so aggravated with these signs on cars, coexist. <laughs> coexist. Folks, you, you can't serve any other gods. You can't exist with those other. You can't disallow other gods. There's only one. And he's in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. God's not a Christian, folks. God's God. Don't let somebody trip you up with religious ideas and religious questions. Learn about him. Know he's God. Know how he works. Know how he operates. You understand that, don't you? You have to understand and know that it's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And I don't have to go through all the things that we go through about right division. I think you understand those things today, how the Word of God's rightly divided and who we are, the body of Christ versus Israel and the 12 tribes. But I tell you this, there ain't nobody like Jesus. There's not another God on earth like Jesus. I wonder if you've ever heard this song. I'll do this in closing. i got two minutes left. I'm done good. I don't know if you've heard this song or not. I like this song. Might not do too good on it, but listen to the words. That's what I want you to hear. <clears throat> There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. None else could heal all our souls' diseases. No, not one. No, not one. Second verse. No friend like him is so high and holy. No, not one. No, not one, and yet no friend is so meek and lowly. No, not one, no, not one. Did ever a saint find this friend forsake him? No, not one, no, not one. Or sinner find that he would not take him? No, not one, no, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Believe in God. He's not a Christian. He's God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege and the honor to stand and open up your word and preach it today. Lord, take these scattered thoughts we've brought and take your word. And Lord, we know your truth and every man a liar. Let us rest upon your word. In the name that's above every name, your son's name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.